What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Team Chat Podcast, a video game show where we talk about games, the ones we love, the ones we hate, and everything in between. I am one of your hosts, Jarrett Wilson, joined across the power of the internet by my co-host, Rachel Mogan. Adios. I mean, not adios. Adios? <laughs> All right, so fine, bye. We're shutting it down for the bye. day. Bye. <laughs> what I meant was bonjour. I don't know what I was thinking. I just oh, bonjour, not even bonjourno. Oh, yeah. Going bonjour. a little French, a little you Spanish, then French, now I, Italian. I have the day off work today, so I'm just, I'm, I'm floating around in, in an ether of confusion, so sorry. <laughs> is it a Saturday? Is it a Yeah, is it a I don't weekend? know. I don't know when it is or where I am right now. Well, because you're getting today off, and then our, and then next week you're gone for the holidays. So I yeah, mean, like, pretty much man, the time. So you're getting a nice solid break. That's you awesome. Get a nice little break and play so many video games as Hell usual. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds awesome. That's gonna be great. Good time to rest, recharge, and all that goodness. But before. Mogan takes off on her week-long excursion and time off. We've got a great gaming topic to talk to you about here on Team Chat Podcast, a weekly video game show where new episodes come out on news on news days, Tuesdays, 9 a.m. Central Time. And you can listen to those on podcast services around the World Wide Web, as well as watch a video version of each episode on our YouTube channel. You can also find us on social media, such as Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Join our Discord server where you can have a lot of great conversation with us when we're not here recording the show. And finally, if you'd like to help make the show bigger and better, you can head over to patreon.com slash team chat podcast, whereas for as little as a dollar a month, you can support the show. And in return, we'll give you cool perks like getting the episodes early before its general Tuesday release, access to a private patron only channel on our Discord server, the Rogues Gallery, and extra good goodies and tidbits like the return of Team Chit Chat coming soon so uh, or maybe even out now we're recording one of those after this one so i'm not quite sure which one no this will hit first team chit chat will be coming later in the week <laughs> so be looking out for that but uh but if you don't want to do that that's no big deal at all we totally understand but you can still help bit the show and make it bigger and better with free ways as well such as subscribing on all the podcast services or wherever you watch and listen telling your friends sharing us on social media all that good stuff helps make the show bigger and better, and we are greatly appreciative and love our patrons and listeners alike. Heart emojis. Big heart. Big ol' heart emojis. Huge. But before we jump into our main topic of the day, let's get a little bit of news and what's coming out soon in our moment with Mogan. Yes, so middle of November had like the bulk of everything that was coming out, so this <laughs> week's moment with Mogan is thankfully going to be a little bit shorter. Uh, so just to recap, out as of this week from November 20th onward, Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity is out now for the Nintendo Switch. Katamari Damachi Reroll is out now for PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. And then coming out as of today, November 23rd, we have World of Warcraft Shadowlands for the PC. Ooh, Tomorrow, nice. oh, the game you've all been waiting for, everybody. November 24th, it's finally here. It's CD Projekt Red's Football Manager 2021. Wait, I'm checking my notes. Does not appear to have been developed by CD Projekt Red, but Football Manager <laughs> like, 2021. What? <laughs> yeah, I was just like, how many people can I trick with this? I was anyway, a little thrown off there. <laughs> Football Manager 2021 is out now for the Xbox Series X and S, the Xbox One, PC, and Mac. No PlayStation or Switch on that one. Oh, Thank really? goodness, we're saved. Uh, so Just Dance 2021 is also out as of the 24th for PlayStation 5 and the Xbox Series X and S. Star Renegades is out for PS4 on November 25th. So is Vigor for, P for PS4. Made of Skr, that's S-K-E-R, is, no is, out, is out on November 26th for the Nintendo Switch. And that's everything coming in the last week of November. Very nice. Is that made of skr M A D E or M A I D? Uh, like maiden, like M A I D maiden. of skr. Okay, cool, cool, cool. I assume I like, a skr is probably something Icelandic, perhaps like yeah. the yogurt. <laughs> perchance, perchance. Speaking of Icelandic, I know it's not necessarily the same, but um, you know, while everybody else is jumping into that big game of the year, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, that's out right now, I picked up on sale on Switch. Northgard, which is like kind of a real time strategy Norse uh, Norse game. And so it's, it looks Age of Empires esque. It's a couple of years old, I think, at this point. 
been on my wish list for a while, but it went on sale as part of Nintendo's Black Friday uh, promotions and stuff like that. So I was like, I'll pick this up, but I'm very curious to start that one. It looks a lot of fun. So I will keep everyone updated. If I wasn't playing Ori and the Will of Wisps, Ori and the Will of the Wisps right now on my stream, I'd probably stream that, but you know. Uh, so just because I was curious, I've looked it up. It doesn't have anything to do with Iceland or skier yogurt. So oh. <laughs> Made of Skur is apparently a first person survival horror game based on British folklore. So, and, and like tales from Britain. So not Icelandic. Okay. Well, Oops. fortunately <laughs> we have some, uh, some, uh, correspondence. That's what I was looking for. We're, right. For the person. Yeah. Correspondence over in the UK who can tell us, Hey, what are these stories about? Right. Because exactly. we don't know. Yeah. We, don't, we need the background. We need the background facts. Yeah. Just Mike plays. Yeah. Tell, tell us what, what it's all about. What's a skur? What's we a need skur? to know. <laughs> Why are there maiden involved? Let us yeah. know. But uh, so our main topic of the day is that we are going to be or bringing a review or more specifically, Mogan is going to be bringing a review of Thunder Lotus Games Spirit Fair, which this actually is a little timely because it was just announced at the Game Award nominations that this game wasn't out was nominated for both games for impact and indie game so what did you think mogan of spirit fair well you've already heard my first impressions so you've also played uh, at least a little bit of the game so i want to start with your impressions of the game and then okay. we can kind of uh, like i'll be chiming in but then we can get into the story stuff later on so this right. is gonna spoiler be all territory stuff and all that we- later yeah, so everything that we talk about right now is going to be stuff that I either said in my first impressions or that are in the earlier stages of the game. So, Jared, what'd you think? Well, first, I guess we should maybe give a little bit of background as to what the game is in case yeah. there's a people's first jumping on chance on it. So why don't you explain that really quick so, so I don't butcher Spirit it. Spiritfarer <laughs> is basically... It boils down to being kind of a relationship management and resource management game. So you play as a character, Stella, and technically her kitty cat, Daffodil, Mm -hmm. uh, as they have just recently become dead. So you do wake up on Charon's boat um, being ferried into the afterlife. But the premise is that Charon is retiring, basically. He's like, I'm kind of tired of this. I'm going to best be hitting the old dusty trail. So he's like, I need a new spirit fairer and I'm just going to go on ahead and appoint you. So he gives Stella and Daffodil something called the Everlight. So the Everlight is really just like a fancy little orb of light that you assume is cosmic life link magic or whatever. So you get the spirit light and then you are sent out into the world of I don't know, the spiritual seas. I think it does have a name. I think like the sea of whatever ocean you're on, it does have an official name in the in the game, but I can't remember what it is. It's been a little while by now since I finished the game. Right. So certain details I may have forgotten, but you're on basically the high seas of the afterlife. You now have your own boat. Um, obviously you didn't inherit Charon's boat because it's tiny and can't really get much done in it so you have a new big giant ship and your job is to sail this ship around to the various islands on this sea of the afterlife uh, and collect up any wayward souls so you're going around picking up souls getting them onto your ship and then you are both managing resources on the ship like food and crops and cows and sheep because you get materials from those those items and those creatures to make your passengers happy. So basically, any new soul that you take onto the ship, they want certain things from you to be able to basically progress themselves into a state where they are ready to be ferried officially into the afterlife through a portal called the Everdoor. So essentially, they're just not quite ready to leave yet, and you have to do everything that you can for them to get them to the point where they are ready to depart, and you can officially complete your job and take them into the afterlife. That's the basic premise. It's a mix of resource management, get items to make items, to get items to make items, to make people happy, hug people, send them into the afterlife. There's a lot of hugging involved. (laughs) A lot of hugging, and then you just kick them right out the door. Yeah. But but, uh, so my first impressions of it, I guess, or my impressions, really, I played... I I will say I played until when you got the first, your first passenger through the Everdoor. Gwen. Uh, Yeah, Gwen. And... um, at that point, I kind of just knew it wasn't necessarily something I was that 
interested in finishing just didn't necessarily hit in the same in the same way with me which is surprising because like we've talked about so many times love stardew valley and like a very similar game in that in that instance for whatever reason and i'm not totally sure what it was this one just didn't hook me i think because even though it is a very similar game it felt a little bit more restricted yeah in what you could do And so I feel like even for the amount of time it took me and I know like I wasn't solely pursuing Gwen and getting Gwen from when she comes aboard the boat to when I uh, take her back to the Everdoor. I know I was doing other things, doing some side activities, even helping out the new passengers that I got on board too. But I played uh, quite a bit. Like I want to say like 10 plus hours, I would say. And I just really felt like a lot of that time I was still doing the same tasks mm, and the it. same things that I started out doing. So I feel like there was a lot, like I got some new things and new jobs that I could do new buildings built, was able to build new things, but it still felt and like the amount of resources I could gather. I had a hard time filling the day basically, I guess yeah. is a good way to say it. Okay. And so um, I still really enjoyed the, feel of the game. I really enjoyed the atmosphere, how it is tackling this heavier subject of death and what happens after that. And, you know, the various stages of preparation people may be at in their lives before that happens. And I thought it did it, it did it a really sweet way as with, um, Stella and daffodil and stuff like that. And just kind of like their handling of everything. It's, it's not dark. It's not depressing. It's very bright and it's very cheerful. And the music's very pleasant. The graphics and animations of it are very smooth. And like, especially as you jump around and move on your boat, which as an upgrade it and everything like that. And you're moving from level to level, like all of that worked together really well, mechanically, very smooth game. It just, I think just having it restricted to a boat, I think was maybe too restrictive of a area for me. Yeah, I get it. So um, in terms of the resource management, we can expand on that a little bit and kind Mm -hmm. of explain more about how it works. So to define your boat, uh, so this game is entirely, it takes place entirely in a 2D space. So it's kind of like a platformer in that sense, but you don't have, at least on the boat, that much space to go. You know, your Mm -hmm. boat is a defined amount of space and you can only build a certain amount of things on your boat that fit into a given square that is essentially your boat's buildable range. So it has a certain amount vertical and a certain amount horizontal that you can build various, various just constructions uh, on your boat. And some of them are required and some of them are more optional. So an example of things that are required are anytime a a new spirit comes onto your boat, they are going to request that you build them a special house. Mm -hmm. So you have to find a way to A, build the house because you need materials like wood, steel, glass, that kinds of things. You need to be able to build the, the house in the first place. And then you also have to place it somewhere that may or may not be strategically based. Some characters snore. So you have to put them further away from everyone else so that they don't they don't have a um, detrimental effect on the happiness level of the other passengers. So building in that space can be a little bit tricky. It was actually one of the facets of the game that I got the most enjoyment out of, just because I like puzzles and I'm a very Mm -hmm. visual person. So being able to uh, modify your buildable space kind of at any time, as long as you have the resources available, that was a very rewarding part for me. And I think that part of the reason it may not have sunk in quite as well for you is maybe just that you didn't have all of the available options unlocked yet, because the game does have kind of a progression system um, in a certain sense in that it does have a very guided approach to what you can do, what you can build, who you can get to in terms of spirits. Mm -hmm. And it does have a certain amount of requirements for you can't just collect up all the spirits and then never take them through the ever door. There are certain points in the game where if you want to continue progressing, you have to have had X amount of people through the Everdoor, or you're not going to be able to expand your ship, which is the key way that you're able to get into new areas. Because the Sea of the Afterlife is not a completely open world until you have a fully upgraded ship. So for example, when you have a really bad ship, you can, not bad, just not 
powerful. You know, right, low level. Yet you pee instead of OP. Uh, you can really only go through fog. Actually, that's not even true. You can go through rain. Rain is what I'm thinking of. Mm -hmm. Like you can sail around and go through rain and that's it. So if you run into anything like an ice flow or rocks or really dense fog, you can't make it through any of those particular ocean bound barriers. You have to get upgrades like a steel prow or a lantern that helps you get through what's it called? Fog or something right. to help you get through ice. You have to have an icebreaker. So you get those items a fair bit later on. They're kind of like at the one third and the two thirds and then the final arc of the game. So depending on what you can get to does dictate what kinds of items you can obtain. So you can't build this is probably not going to, this is just for example, I don't think that this is actually accurate, but let's say that you can't build a foundry, which mm -hmm. lets you, you know, smelt metals into other things. You can't build a foundry in the initial part of the game because A, you don't have the blueprint for it. I think you have to buy that um, from the ship construction guy. So you have to A, get the blueprints for a foundry and B, you have to get ash wood. And in that initial part of the map that you can get to at the very beginning, you only have access to oak wood. So where do you get ash? It's in all of the islands that are beyond the fog. So that's just mm. an example. I actually don't think any of what I just said is entirely accurate. So don't take that at face value. But that gives you an example of how the flow of the game is meant to go by region. So... so that kind of though brings up what like I, I get that and I and I ran into that too like I got to the parts like I kept trying to go through the ice flow part and I was like yeah. why can't I go through this yet oh I bet I need to get upgrades but I still played for 10 hours and I wasn't able to get there yet so I kind of feel like the game's timeline could have been compressed a little bit and yes. that would have helped me like it better so, granted I know I'm not I'm not every gamer out there no, so you here's obviously the thing. I yeah. completely agree with that exact sentiment because I ran into kind of like a roll, like if you were looking at a graph, I would call it like a roller coaster cycle of being really, really interested in the game. So when I first started out, I was hooked. I was mm -hmm. super into it. I was really excited, had a ton of fun playing it for those first few hours. And then I kind of got to the same point that you did of being like, I kind of feel like I've explored everything in this area already. Yeah. And I'm just not really making it to the next area quite yet. So there are certain points where it has, for me especially, like a steep drop off in interest level because it's like, I kind of already did everything here and I'm ready to move on to the next area, but I have to do X, Y, Z things in the game to be able to get to that area. And it seemed to take longer than I also think it should have. Yeah. I think that the game as a whole could have been made a little bit shorter. Uh, I definitely agree with that sentiment. Um, particularly by the very end game of Spiritfarer, I, I really had that feeling because basically, you know, you complete, it's like, yay, having so much fun, yay, yay. And then steep drop off when you realize you're kind of out of room in that area. And then you get to a new area finally and it's like, oh yes, this is amazing. I'm having so much fun. And then another big drop off in interest when you just kind of clean up shop and there's not really much more for you to explore. And then you get to another area and it's this big increase. And then kind of by the end of the game, I like ended at the, at the, bowl of one of those lines so it's like oh man i think that oh, the timing really? of this i think the timing of the game is something that could have used a little bit more fine tuning um i don't think you're alone in that uh maybe you and me are the only two gamers that had that experience but i definitely had a lot of fluctuation in how much i was enjoying the game which for comparable resource management games like pikmin uh and stardew valley and animal crossing Mm -hmm. those games don't have even close to the same kind of trend, like the same kind of trend in how, in how your interest level waxes and wanes. So mm -hmm. that was a new experience for me to kind of encounter that in a game. And I think a big part of the reason has to do with the fact that Spirit Fair is a finite game. Animal Crossing and Stardew Valley, they're not finite. Technically, Pikmin was a finite game but you could just kind of keep going and going as long as you wanted until you were literally out of stuff yeah so it 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 being a finite game i think did impact how its flow works and i think it should have been 
a little bit more finite. I, I just think it should have been a little shorter overall. I can agree with that sentiment. Well, I think too, because it also kind of had like, and I think what causes those ebbs and flows is you do get stuck in that period of, okay, I'm doing these tasks that I have to do for the passengers that I have on the boat with me right now. And you have to like, as you said, in some cases, get those people off before you can bring more people on. Whereas Stardew, for example, is every day you have the potential to have to have a better day than the day before. True. In terms of like what you take home, what you sell, what you're able to craft, what you're able to build. And so I think for Spirit Fair, where it doesn't quite hit that mark, is that you will have repetitive day like several days that are the yeah. exact same yeah and i think like you only really experience that in stardew i guess if you in like the winter where yeah, that's true you know maybe all you're doing there is you're just spending the whole winter mining and just hoping you know that and praying that the month will speed up like why the month in stardew of of, of winter or the season of winter is the same length as everything else is insane like that's kind of silly i actually but, love winter that's <laughs> the point <laughs> yeah story for another time D- different time. but i think that's partially why it has that like ebb and flow of time is that it is it's not as just boundless in what you can achieve yeah. in a day yeah. um but like so talk a little bit then, I guess, about like the the passengers themselves. That's obviously a very big component of this game and bringing people onto your boat and interacting with them. I did really love that portion, especially like learning what they ate and like what they enjoyed and then the challenges that that their various appetites kind of brought to the table. What what were your thoughts on like the the passengers? Yeah, so that's actually one of the kind of what you just said was one of my uh, more favorite parts of the game. Um, so the resource management itself, I did usually find pretty interesting, except in cases where I didn't have, there just wasn't a lot that needed to be done. So it was like, well, okay, I guess I'll just kind of kick back and relax. But each of the passengers on your ship, they do have a given like character sheet, basically, where let's take, for example, we'll just start with Gwen, because mm-hmm. she's the she's more or less the tutorial character and that's big air quotes right because she's the first one you get and she is the first one that you are forced by the game to take through the ever door so i don't really count that as a spoiler because it's 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 square one that's right. starting from square one so gwen has and each character has uh, a given list of what they like and dislike uh, what their favorite food is and what they um kind of what their comfort level is with you that specifically applies to a way later character but the gist is they have likes and dislikes they have favorites and they have things that they really hate and all of those things contribute to their happiness level so each character has like a little scale of very unhappy mildly unhappy totally neutral mood pretty good mood the best mood possible Mm -hmm. and mood does affect how characters will interact with you because let's say for example that Gwen's in a really good mood if she's in an excellent mood she might give you something she might actually give you a physical object that you can either sell or that you can eat or that you can give to another character as a gift or as a food so when characters are really really happy usually something really good happens right if they're neutral meh you know it could go either way. It doesn't really matter. If they're unhappy, that means that you're not going to be able to progress their given story because it does kind of hold up the line in that they have to be at a certain amount of happiness in order for them to trigger their next activities. So the foods in particular... I loved. So yeah. filling up the recipe book, because you can experiment with different foods to make recipes in uh, the building called the kitchen, obviously. So if I go into the kitchen and I put together, there's really a limit of putting together two ingredients maximum. So you can cook a single item and how you cook it. So if I put an apple into the kitchen, it'll spit me out a baked apple, for example. I don't actually think that's a real item, but that's just my I think breath. it was actually. That sounds Is it? Or was that Breath of the Wild? I don't know. I, I think or that's maybe breath just like a fruit wild. skewer or something like that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's something really basic that is just like cooked fruit. And it's like, yeah, okay, there we go. Uh, if you put flour into the into the kitchen eventually, it'll give you bread. Uh, so that's kind of the the gist of it. But then later on, once you kind of upgrade the kitchen, it's like if I put together clams and flour 
maybe it'll give me a clam chowder mm. if I put together milk and meat. Cookies. Maybe, oh, <laughs> milk and meat. <laughs> maybe that'll give me a beef stew. So there's mm. all kinds of different things that you can just experiment with. And some ways in the broader world will actually give you recipes. And then you can check those recipes and make those things on your own. But a lot of it is just, you know, wild experimenting. And I got a lot out of that personally, because once you unlock all of these foods, you're then able to test them on your passengers. Because like Astrid, for example, she loves plain, simple food. She hates anything too fancy. So if you give her um, sushi, which is considered like exotic, she'll be like, whoa, I don't like that. I will not be eating that. Thank you. Hunger. The other factor they have is hunger. That's what I was trying to say the whole time. So they do have to eat on your ship. So if you try to give her something that she hates, she flat out won't eat it. But if I give her noodle soup, which is the simplest item you can make, she'll be like, oh, that's perfect she I loves love those comfort food. foods yeah she loves those com- those simple plain foods like a single cooked fish she'll be like yes that's the jam so uh each of your passengers has has like a category of foods that they will really like for example one might love plain and dessert foods another might love exotic and uh, I don't remember what the other ones are right now. Stimulants yeah, like, like coffee. So oh, like yeah, coffee yeah. and tea, they might like that kind of stuff. And then they'll usually have at least one or two categories of food that they don't like. And I just got a lot of fun out of trying those out. And then usually once you find out what the categories are that a character likes in food, you're then able to keep testing out foods in that category to find their most favorite food of all. And if you give them their favorite food, it raises their happiness way more than the other foods would so i don't know i found that really fun that was like one of the highlights of the game for me was testing out food on people i just i just thought it was super fun yeah it it was really fun getting to do that i will say gwen though as the first passenger and her food requirements basically like she won't eat the same thing twice in a row and which i didn't quite understand i first understood that as she just wouldn't eat the same dish twice at all And so I was like, oh, my God, how do you do this when there's so limited food options at this point? Like, but then I realized, oh, she just won't eat them right after the other twice in a row. So you have to, like, give her things in the middle. And then she does also like some fancier foods. So she's good in that case because it gives you a lot. She gives a lot of really good practice i guess and getting to experiment in the different foods and and whatnot i agree but um then the second or the second passenger i got which i I won't say necessarily what what his character is yet but uh liked everything and so you could it didn't matter what you gave you could just give him whatever (laughs) exactly so that was always kind of nice um i did so the food and the cooking and stuff was really good i did i did enjoy that too and like seeing the reactions to the different things and it was really funny too it's just like how sometimes the put out especially Gwen would be if you gave her something you didn't like it's like oh, yeah. you're he- I'm here serving you getting you to the afterlife maybe it'd be a little nicer I with wanted how to be you like, respond to dude, my cooking it's my boat you'll eat what exactly. I give you <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah so I think that was a really fun again not just like oh this boat needs to be fully stored I like that, that how it did that where it gave a little bit of puzzle yeah. to to the passengers and you had to figure out these things about them, which obviously you figured out a lot of these things too, through their convert through conversations you would have through them. And then you could also raise their, their level by hugging them when appropriate as well, because like sometimes they wouldn't want the hug. Sometimes they're like, yeah, I'd give that hug here, you know, all that stuff, which helped their levels as well. Um, but with the, the other parts of it. So there is this, it, it, like you said, it's not necessarily an open world at the very beginning. Like you do have, there are boundaries to where you can go and places you can ex- explore. How did you feel about all that? Like setting like landfall, making landfall at different places yeah. and going on land. So the exploration factor in particular, I was another big highlight of the game for me. So to give you an idea of what the, the map looks like, if you're viewing it from like a top down map view, you can only see things in areas that you have actually explored. Mm -hmm. Everything else is blacked out by the shadowy inkiness. So by either driving your boat through those blacked out inky areas or by getting to like 
a major landmark that is like usually the bigger island in that region or just one of the kind of getting to any official island. Once you make landfall on that island, it kind of opens up a little bit of a radius around that area where you can kind of see on the edges, like, okay, I think something might be over there, something might be over there. But for the most part, you really have to unlock most of the map by actually sailing around all of the different areas. And it is worth noting that some of the islands will actually be proactively marked on your map, even if that area is blacked out, because they're specifically related to a story thing. So mm. it'll be like, oh, well, we have to go there, and because a character told you you have to. So it's like, okay, I know there's an island over there, so that's where I'm going to go. But there are other islands that never officially show up on your map until you find them. And mm. that part I found really fun, because there are actually a few islands like at the far edges and just really kind of hard to see that I thought were really fun just like secrets to find uh, so i liked that part of the game a lot you do sometimes it's a little slow because when you're on the high seas you put your ship into motion to sail it around and then you kind of go do other stuff on the boat so sailing can be a little slow but towards the end of the game when you have a fully upgraded ship you're fast as all get out oh, okay i didn't know if the speed would be was one of no, the things that got upgraded you can definitely upgrade the speed and eventually i, I got to a point where i was like i'm too fast I don't have enough time to do stuff on my boat because I'm getting places too quick. But even if you're really slow at the time, you do also eventually get to these, um, what are basically bus stops. They're boat bus stops that are more or less fast travel points. So if you get to a bus stop on one end of the map, you can then have him take you all the way to the other side, as long as you have that other stop unlocked. So oh, cool. there is a fast travel option, and you do get to upgrade the boat to like maximum speed. So both of those really helped exploration and helped it to not be too tedious. So the exploration parts, I really enjoyed, and I just liked getting to new islands and getting to explore them a little bit more. I will say that in general, the you, you wouldn't have gotten to this part, but there's a particular section of the map where all of the islands are like cities. They're like yeah. modern cities and kind of suburbs. I hated all of those islands. I was like, I don't want to hang out at a city where there's like graffiti and dumpsters everywhere. This is not what I'm here for. I wanted like <laughs> the really pretty islands or the northern icy islands or the misty mountain islands. So those city islands in particular, I was like, boo, this sucks. <laughs> but the other islands and the other like smaller towns, I was like, yay, these are so pretty. I'm having so much fun. So I liked exploring each of the individual islands, even if they were really small. And I liked the process of getting to them. So that's another part of the game that I thought was really good, in my opinion. And so another part of going to these islands, too, was not only to potentially take on other passengers, but you could also there find new resources. Like some islands would have trees you could chop down. Some were a mine and you would be able to mine various stones, gems, what have you. Or even there were some shops at, at a couple that you could buy yeah. some things that you need too. That is part of where I ran into a little bit of the issue or my issue with the finite resource management in that you would go to an island and you could maybe chop down three trees that would maybe give you eight logs. Yeah. And then you'd have to leave the island and then you have to sail around and come back to the island if you wanted to get those resources again. Yeah, so it true. kind of like threw in, that was another one of the little things for me. I was just like, just let me like let them respawn faster. Maybe give me a few more options because especially some of the buildings you're having to get. Granted, I know it's not. It's probably that balance of resource getting the resources and then being able to quickly turn around and not being able to build too fast. Yeah. But it also did feel like I came to this island and I sailed ten minutes or whatever to get to this island to get eight pieces of wood. Cool. I still need twenty, so I got to go to somewhere else. And yeah. so that was a little a little frustration for me too. But I then did appreciate how you get these items. Like you, like one of the first islands you can go to has a shop where you can buy like linen threads and different things like this. Right. The uh, when you did discover an island with trees, and you could take those back to the shop. Once you got or back to the boat. Once you got back on your boat, and time had progressed, you could start building sh buildings like you mentioned the foundry or like the wood shop and kitchen, different things like this that can allow you to uh, manipulate those items into better resources or better yeah. versions of themselves. So I do like that it had the one, two aspect to it where here's the collection, here's the refinement. You can use yeah. both. 
But what it, what did you kind of think of those like mini games, I guess, almost of the of the resource refinement? Yeah, great question. So this also ties into the characters. Um, so the process of obtain, refine, I think is a really good way of describing it. So for example, with Atul, um, with like the second character you get more or less, uh, he allows you to build a, a building called the sawmill. So you take the raw logs that you've gathered on the smaller islands, islands, bring them back to your ship, and then you have to basically do like a little tiny mini game where you run them through the sawmill, but you have to manipulate your, your saw more or less in such a way that you actually get usable logs. It's not difficult. Like all of the, most of the mini games were really easy. Oh, I had the I, hardest time keeping the saw on, on the, track. So <laughs> at first the sawmill was so hard hard but eventually i was like god tear at it and i was like i'm incredible <laughs> so it nice. took a little practice but it, that's the point it took a little practice and i thought that that was a nice little touch the other ones that i really liked were gwen gives you the um the threadery <laughs> <laughs> loom was it the loom the loom yeah 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 <laughs> i couldn't think of the word for it so you get raw fibers from either growing them on your ship or finding them out and about in the world and then you take them to the loom and you have to weave them into either thread or and this is something that you probably didn't get to a lot of the refinements go from a refine level one to later a refine level two or even a three so mm. if i get cotton thread from the loom Later on, I can weave that thread into cotton fabric. So I liked that there were various levels of, okay, I got this loom and I've got plenty of thread, which is useful for some things, but that didn't expire throughout the game because eventually you just add on to that. Mm. So that was another facet of the game that I really enjoyed. So each of the individual characters, not all of them give you something that is for you to build but each of them does come with their own mini game, which we can kind of go into a bit more for some of the characters that are a little bit vaguer. So uh, one of my one of the mini games that I really enjoyed was Atul's. So he has he's a big frog man. He's a big I loved beautiful Atul, blue honestly. frog man. Yeah, he, <laughs> he was, was great. awesome. Uh, so he he's a frog. So obviously he loves the rain because it feels good on his froggy skin. So if you uh, flew, if you sail your ship into any area. Of the map that has a thunderstorm he'll come out on deck and he'll be like oh i love rain and he'll start playing his flute because he's just playing with the sounds of the universe and i was like yeah you jam man this is awesome and him running into that thunderstorm will trigger an event and he'll basically ask you hey do you want to catch lightning? Because I'll play you a song and you can run around the ship and do like a little platforming mini game where you get to catch lightning. Mm -hmm. I thought that was super fun. It was uh, so really fun. It really is just a platforming mini event because lightning strikes at various points on the ship. And of course, you've built up all of these different levels of vertical buildings by this point. So you have to like hop around to actually catch the lightning wherever it's going to strike. And it so, gets pretty frantic. Like it, there, it was a lot. Frantic. Yeah, uh, I liked that a lot. And I'm not going to go into too much of how this happens, but just in case you're wondering, once you ferry any individual character through the Everdoor, you do still have a way to trigger their event. So mm. don't be afraid about getting rid of somebody because you're going to lose access to their event. You can still access their event later on. And there are some special events out in the world that you can encounter early on but you don't really know what to do with them yet because you haven't acquired the character to trigger that event. So you have to at least have unlocked the spirit that you need to trigger certain events, which was something else that I found nice. I liked that touch. I, I liked most of the mini games. Uh, they all kind of came with their own special soundtrack, which I thought was really fun. Uh, mm -hmm. So the soundtracks for all of those were really fun. They were just a nice little like tedium breaker that you got to stop mining resources, stop giving people food and just go out and have this little mini game. So I, I liked the mini games a lot. Some of them were annoying, but most of them I enjoyed. Yeah. I, I, I think the only one, really one that I was able to interact with in my time with it is when you would c catch the jellyfish mm, and that yeah, one got a little more annoying. The, the lightning was fun though. I did. Yeah, I did like the fun. lightning getting to jump around. Cause the nice thing about these is these mini games aren't just to do like it provides you another resource yeah, that you they can get you use. Something else. Exactly. So, um, I guess that's really all of the mechanics and stuff that yeah. I really knew of or slash that I guess you have. So what, if you want to kind of j venture now into some more spoiler territory, cause I know you talked about the ebbs and flows of the game. 
yeah. with your levels of enjoyment about it. So if you want to be able to dig, dig a little deeper into that point, so uh, we'll go into a little bit more story stuff, things like that now. So anybody who wants to avoid spoilers to Spirit Fair, now's your time to yeah. uh, jump away until we do our wrap up at the end. And, and I'm not kidding about that. I'm going to be going into some big spoilers for like individual characters too. So definitely tune out if you don't want to hear this. Roro in particular, I know you haven't finished the game. If you're listening, tune out. <laughs> So, but yeah, so we, we I do have chapters set up in YouTube and on the podcast, so you can skip, look at the timestamps yeah. or skip ahead in the chapters to be able to skip this part. Yeah. So the characters, uh, the characters are both what make the game very, very good. And I'll just go on ahead and say it ultimately for me, not that good. Um, oh. My feelings on Spirit Fair, having finished the game are very mixed. Uh, like we said, during a lot of the kind of more mechanical aspects of the game, more of the gameplay aspects. There were things that I really liked about Spirit Fair. I liked the exploration. I liked the resource management for the most part. I liked building. I liked being able to customize my ship. I liked being able to care for the people on my ship. I enjoyed all of those parts. But, and actually Just Mike Plays made kind of a joke about this on Twitter. And I realized later he was totally right. So he kind of made a jab at like, okay, I'm going to go play Spirit Fair now and just get progressively more depressed the entire time. <laughs> and that was true. So, and this is kind of something that I feel like, I kind of feel like I got tricked. Like I kind of feel like the game tricked me a little bit because yeah. all of the advertising for it was like, oh, this is going to be a soft, cuddly game about death where you're going to hug people and ferry them into the afterlife. And you're going to, you're going to help them come to find acceptance of death. But as I found with more than one character, that kind of isn't, isn't true like at least half of the time and that they don't have like a happy ending that they don't have like a good not even a happy ending it seemed to me like a lot of them didn't even have because the idea is that you're helping them find acceptance right mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. lot of them you get them to the ever door and they're like on their way out and their closing statements to you are just depressing oh and it's like oh I this mean, it's not what I thought it was going to be. <laughs> to be fair, I kind of thought Gwen's, even for your first interaction and first passenger, hers was a little heavy and dark because she so, obviously had like some familial background stuff yeah. in history that like made her childhood or life not that great. And she was like trying to wrap that up and find some closure in that. And I don't really feel like she got it. Yeah, I kind of think that that's also true. So just just so that people know, um, I'm not sure that this is entirely the case. I really couldn't verify this for every character, but it is it is factual in game that some of the people you're taking onto your ship are people that Stella herself knew in her life when she was still alive. Gwen is canonically one of her closest childhood friends. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you're ferrying Gwen into the afterlife is especially emotional because she's your friend. Atul, he is confirmed to be your uncle. Uh, the third character that you get, Summer, the snake, Oh, she, I liked was her. Of, she was one of my favorites. She's your awesome lesbian aunt. And it's like, yeah, this is the best. <laughs> Who's like Love super this. into like stones and crystals yeah, she's and like, like new age, new here. age stuff. She yeah. Guitar and she's got a crystal set up in her room. And I was like, you're the best. So yeah, I good. love you. <laughs> so a lot of the characters have really fun personalities, but I totally agree with the sentiment that the further you progress, most of them in their individual stories, they just kind of get progressively more sad. Mm. And it felt like towards the end of it, because let's take Summer, for example. So the entire time that you're talking to Summer at the outset, she's teaching you how to, how to sing and how to play the guitar. And she's telling you all about her life with your, your other aunt, the aunt that she married, and how happy she was in her life. And then kind of it takes this hard turn into she had this constant challenge in her life that she was never fully able to overcome. And it is heavily implied to be some sort of illness. You know, maybe it was cancer, maybe it was... I don't know, any, any sort of terminal illness, because apparently that is what killed her, it would seem. Mm. So the idea, I guess, is that she was pursued her entire life by this illness, and it is what eventually killed her. And when you ferry her through the Everdor, she kind of describes it in text as like this ambivalent, the dragon. 
like it's just sort of this otherworldly force that she can't outrun. And when you're ferrying her through the Everdor, Everdor, she even kind of goes further into that. And she's like, man, I just feel so tired. I feel so broken down. I'm tired of, I'm tired of having to run. I'm never going to escape this thing. I, I guess that's just it for me. And it's not like a st- it didn't it didn't feel to me like a state of acceptance. It felt mm-hmm. like a state of just like caving into depression. Yeah, broken just down. Like, yeah, just being broken down. And it was like, oh, I I don't know how to feel about this. And that mm-hmm. wasn't just Summer. Some of the other characters, they go through that Everdor and like Astrid. She's one of the characters you get later on. She's really fun and cool. Love Astrid. She probably died of old age. You kind of can get from her, from her talking because she is very old. Like even her spirit is like an old soul. So she just kind of, as you're ferrying her through the Everdor, she's like, everything hurts. Aging is the worst. Dying is painful. Bye. And it's like, Damn. oh, God, <laughs> this okay. sucks. Uh, I mean, I felt like that was kind of the case for a lot of characters. The two in particular that I can kind of point to and say, okay, I feel like those two characters are actually accepting of going into the afterlife. I feel like this was actually a, a, a positive resolution for all of us. Gustav, my favorite. Gustav, the I got, so he looks like kind of a vaguely Egyptian bird, like a hieroglyph bird. Hmm. So in my head, I constantly called him Osiris, but that's not his <laughs> name. His name is Gustav. Uh, he's like an artist and a professor, and he's a museum curator. He's not a collector. Hmm. When you take him into the Everdor, he's like, you know, I feel like I really accomplished something here today. Art is what life is. Art is what makes life worth living is basically Gustav's final message. And I was like, oh, finally, a good message. Like art is what makes it all worth it. You have to, you know, creating gives you power. And I was like, yes, Gustav, you're the best. Mm -hmm. And then there's the other character who's actually in the trailer, uh, Giovanni. He's the big purple lion. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stella hugging in the trailer. Uh, He's a total playboy. You get the sense that he probably is like an elderly Italian man. And he's like, hey there, pretty lady. I've got some jewelry (laughs) for you. You want this? Giovanni, you're the best. (laughs) So he is definitely a cad. Him and Astrid are canonically together. um, And he cheated on Astrid real bad so he is a flawed character but he like his whole his whole ethos is he's living life to the fullest and sure it's gotten him into trouble many times in the past but when you ferry him through the everdoor he's like you know what hashtag yolo hashtag no regrets i'm not sorry the (laughs) only thing that he really apologizes for to you not even to the person in question but he he does express actual regret at having not been able to keep astrid because he did actually love her like he loved astrid and he did actually feel bad about cheating on her that he couldn't quite treat her right and he's like but you know that's just kind of life. Mm-hmm. And then he goes through the Everdor. And I was like, he, he even kind of parts with saying, you know how I am. I don't like to stay in any one place too long. And I was like, yes, okay, there you go. He's actually ready to go. Sure, he feels bad about one thing in his life, but he seems to have accepted that he is a flawed person. So I was like, yes, okay, two for two. Osiris, aka Gustav, and Giovanni both had what I felt were better resolutions. Most... All of the other characters, of which there are probably eight, eight to ten, I think there are approximately eight to ten total characters, all of the others, uh, big downers. Even a tool? So here's the thing about a tool. Oh no. You, yeah, here's a big spoiler for you specifically. You don't actually ferry a tool through the Everdor. He disappears. What? Um, he just straight up disappears. Like you you get to the end of his kind of personal quest line, which is that he's trying to recreate his family because, you know, he left behind his presumably wife and I think daughters. I think he Mm -hmm. says he has daughters, but he left behind what you gather is probably a big family. And throughout the entire game, you can tell that he's really into family. He's a family man. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the game, even after you kind of do his final quest, which is throwing a family style dinner for you and other people, for you, a tool and other people on the ship, He's really happy about that, 
But then after that event happens, he's like, you know what it made me realize? My family's gone and I'm never going to see them again. And I'm not happy about it. And then he just kind of disappears. What the hell? You don't even get to ferry him through the door. So what? Okay. Now yeah. See, I get what you're saying. It's, yeah. It's not good. So now we're going to take a hard, hard turn into super spoiler territory. So Okey-dokey. what interspersed throughout ferrying different characters through the Everdoor, let's say that you ferry the first three through the Everdoor. And I don't remember exactly when these points happen. So do not quote me on this, but they happen periodically. Mm. So periodically, as you ferry X amount of characters through the Everdoor, Stella herself goes into this like alternate reality, an alternate dimension for a hot second where you appear to be in just cosmic space. You're just kind oh, of, Oh, I remember this. Yeah. You've probably encountered at least one. I think the yeah, first yeah, one yeah. does happen after Gwen. Yes. So you go into this cosmic space and it's very peaceful. It's very beautiful. And you kind of do this little platforming event. And as you platform through these different sections of this spatial plane, uh, Stella can play her guitar at these big, like empty crystal walls. And when she plays her guitar at these walls, the Everlight paints an image onto this crystal that is clearly a reference to Stella's own life. Mm. So I think at that first one, the rough images give you a basic outline, I think, of Stella and Gwen's relationship because the characters are kind of color-coded. I think Stella is the yellow character, maybe. She might be like orangey yellow. I think she's more like a, a, a red because oh, I think she she, doesn't, summer, summer wears the, the yellow. Summer is yellow. And then um, Atul is blue, or like a turquoise. Blue. I don't remember how they coded Gwen's color, but the, but the gist is that once you deliver Gwen through the door, you get a few images that kind of seem to paint like, oh, this was their childhood growing up together. Like there's one of them playing and riding bikes. And there's one of them, I think maybe at a party or something. I'm not exactly sure, but you get these like background images of Stella's own life, which I was like, okay, this is nice. Uh, and then when you get to the end of this little platforming event, you encounter this like, mysterious interdimensional perhaps just spiritual incorporeal creature that is a very large owl like basically just this huge spirit owl Mm -hmm. and the owl kind of talks to stella and it's like so here you are then i think you know who i am but are you willing to admit it like he has this very cryptic well it it has this very cryptic speech around it Uh, and it's like oh we will meet again and you're like okay Thanks. Hmm. And then you kind of get spit back out into the the world of the high seas. So as you continue to unlock more of these images, as you keep getting more of them through fairing souls through, you do gather that I think, and I cannot, uh, I can't prove this for sure, specifically because of the last two characters I got. um, I think that everyone that Stella ferries on her ship is someone that she knew in real life because she appears to have been some sort of nurse or hospital or maybe even a hospice uh, Mm. care worker. Because you can tell through images that usually are of people that appear to be dying in hospital beds that she was some sort of of end-of-life caregiver as her profession, you gather. So even though Gwen is your friend and Atul is your uncle and Summer is your aunt... Those people you actually helped physically in the real world. You helped those people die. I mean, that's, mm-hmm. that's, that's what it is. You helped them in, in their end days. So I guess what that means then is that kind of each of the characters and how you kind of talk to them and get their vague backstory, it's implied that a tool, for example, in real life just disappeared. You know, you don't, I don't think Stella knows what happened to him. He just kind of disappeared one day and that was that. Summer, she probably did die of cancer or or, or any other type of terminal illness. The same thing goes for Gwen. Uh, Based on how much she chain smokes on your ship, where she loves her cigarettes, (laughs) who knows? Maybe lung cancer got her. And this is partially speculation, but it is supported by things that happen in the game. So, again, at the end of the game, you kind of encounter this this spatial owl creature for what is more or less the last time. Like you have to go to the Everdoor yourself once you've gotten all of the characters that you kind of need. You don't have to ferry every single character through the Everdoor. Mm. There are a couple of last arc ones that are more or less optional. 
you don't have to have gotten them through the Everdor to be able to finish the game. And I didn't, because I was like, I'm depressed. I'm depressed, and I'm frankly not having a good time anymore. I'm just going to go on ahead and wrap this game up. So I went to the Everdor. Stella goes through the Everdor with Daffodil. It is very emotional because it's like, oh, Daffodil, my giddy cat. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then she just kind of goes back to that spatial world and talks to this owl creature again. And it's like, do you know who I am now? And it's implied, and I kind of can't figure out what I what I sort of think it is. I either think that it is an embodiment of death itself, or perhaps a more ambiguous embodiment of grief, and of okay. like the the grief that comes from losing people. Yeah. Not really sure, but it gives you some parting words at the end, and I don't remember the exact gist of it, but. Maybe it was just me and my state of ta- my state of mind at the time. I did not get. Uh, I don't know if the game was supposed to feel hopeful. Maybe it was just supposed to feel cathartic. I didn't have any of those feelings at the end. I didn't feel like it was an especially even a neutral. I, mm. I'm not even sure I would call it a neutral ending. When the game ended. I, I only felt depressed and not in the good way. Not oh. in the way that you're like, oh, okay, I, I got a good cry out. I feel better now. I yeah. was like, this is bleak. This is bleak. Because it like paints death as just like the final and you're never ready for it. And it always comes before you're, you're, you need it to. And it's just not, always is going to tear you and your family apart. Kind yeah, of thing. Like it was just mm. like, wow. Yeah, that sucks. <laughs> so sure, maybe that is realism. But also, is that what you necessarily want in a game? And I felt like tonally, it felt like such a mismatch to how the game kind of packages itself, that there was this just big disconnect of me just going, oh, what a happy, fun, beautiful, colorful world, juxtaposed with just total bleak, sad depression. Damn. And, I, and I, this is probably too dramatic. I am probably being a little dramatic, but I think I kind of got like, low-key actually depressed like after the game ended for a few weeks oh, like damn. for a few, for for like a for like about a month and maybe a half and then paradise killer came out and everything was okay again <laughs> pulled you from the darkness it pulled me up by the bootstraps but really like I'm yeah, especially a- like in a year like this you don't necessarily want something that's going to make you more depressed <laughs> yeah so i i know that this is not probably it isn't the review I wanted to give. I desperately wanted to love Spirit Fair, and for a solid 50% of the game, I loved it. I had a great time. Would I recommend it to other people, knowing what I know and having the experience that I personally had? No. That's why mm-hmm. so we, we probably didn't talk about this on the episode earlier, but I kind of talked Jared out of buying it. I was like, I don't think you should buy it. Cause I yeah, had finished you did. it and I was you were, like, you, you were just like, yeah, I think you play it until yeah. you feel like you have a good idea, but I like, don't spend the money on it. And I'm, and I'm honestly like, I'm glad I'm because yeah, I'm that would have been, either. yeah, because I'm, I'm glad I feel like I would have got to that 50% part and been like, you know what? Nah, yeah, I'm out. Um, I mean, it was kind of a, I had to actually really try to push myself to finish the game at all. And then when I did finish it, I was kind of like, wish I hadn't. Yeah. Wish I had that time back. Kind of wish I hadn't experienced this whole thing. So it's, it's kind of like the opposite. Like uh, take for another game that w- that dealt with grief and it and its repercussions. Grace or Greece. Like yeah. the end of that game. True. Like you know something terrible happened and like you're and you're overcoming something. The end of that game though is triumphant. You yeah. feel good again. It instilled in you in that that almost the sense of death is not the end kind of thing. It's interesting then that this one marketed and like presents itself as this lighter tale, but then goes so deep into the dark. And I think part of this, I just, I just want to clarify, plenty of people might not have the same experience. There are right. a lot of people that might go through those same stories and feel like they got a, a totally different outcome. I think something that particularly I felt was unusual is that the game never really seemed to paint death as a relief as Mm -hmm. a release and especially dealing with characters that had clearly died of bad circumstances, like of terminal illness. That's a relief, but that's not how it was painted. And it's just like, man, you know, a lot of people towards the end, once you finally realize that you're going to die, you're like, 
you know what? I kind of feel like it is, it's my time and I feel like I'm ready to go. And yeah, it's going to, it's scary and it's gonna, probably going to hurt, but I'm, I'm ready for it. Right. And other people, you know, it's quick and painless and you never even know what happened. And I feel like those options of, you know, sometimes it's time, sometimes it's time to go. Mm-hmm. That didn't really seem to be represented. And I just, I don't know. So I, I kind of didn't hit right. It just didn't hit right. It just didn't land for me. And the way it did land was bad. So I, I like, I feel bad about giving what is essentially a not good review, but I'm honestly not, I don't think I would recommend spirit fair to other people. Sorry. I know that it's <laughs> well, nominated I mean, some, for a bunch of awards, but yeah, but I mean, sometimes it just does. Games just don't hit in the way yeah. that they're supposed to. And you know, maybe that was their goal of paying more of a depressing picture of death. Although yeah, I don't know necessarily so. I why, do still think, but I do still think that it's a well-made game. I think it's yeah. really well-made and produced. I just didn't, I just didn't like the final product because of, because of the way it was intentionally made. So it's not an accident. <laughs> that's just the way it is. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's not necessarily Sorry. what I was expecting uh, for you to say either. But yeah. obviously, though, if you have played Spirit Fair or uh, enjoying Spirit Fair, not enjoying Spirit Fair, anything like that, like we would love to know what you've thought of this game yeah. as well. So, you know, leave us a comment, write us a, write us a quick email at teamchatpodcast at gmail.com, comment on our social media, let us know in the Discord, Put it anything in the Discord. like that. Yeah. I, I so, am, I, I want to say I'm very interested to hear what other people had have to say that have actually mm-hmm. finished it because I didn't, I didn't read any other reviews because obviously I wanted to go into the game blind. So, and I haven't read any since then. So I, I'm really curious to see how other people feel about it. Very nice. Well, so yeah, let us know, please, because we would like to know your thoughts as well. Also, but- sorry. I feel bad about that. <laughs> no, sometimes, sometimes the games not aren't good, and yeah. you can't paint a rosy picture of it and, to, and lie to people. We're not here to lie to people, Mogan. We're here to deliver our yeah, true that's opinions, true. <laughs> and that's what we've done. Yeah. And that's what we've delivered to you all today. But hey, you know, of the running total of all the games we reviewed, how many of them have we actually been like, nah, Probably we didn't like it? Two. <laughs> like, right? Like, like two it's three. a very low number number <laughs> so oh overall boy. we're still doing we're doing good but uh but yeah i guess unless you had any other thoughts on it or anything like that that pretty much wraps up this episode of team chat podcast please again like we said let us know what you thought of spirit fair because we are very interested to hear other people's opinion of this game as well but uh next week i guess is going to be or next uh our next episode is going to be our streaming day so come back i believe that's on december 2nd i'm checking something real quick to be absolutely sure no december 1st actually is gonna be our uh streaming our next streaming day so come back and enjoy that i hope everybody does have a good thanksgiving holiday in whatever capacity you're able to this year take some time off relax recharge all that good stuff. And we will see you back for our streaming day. But until next time, everybody, I'm one of your hosts, Jarrett Wilson, joined by my co-host, Rachel Mogan. Peace out. We'll see you all next time.